straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Definitely setting the stage for something uh, that is sure to be contentious. The prosecution's star witness takes the stand in the federal trial of Michael Abenati. Plus, who President Biden intends to nominate as the next Supreme Court justice. That person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. And Prince Andrew wants a trial by jury amid sexual abuse allegations from an Epstein survivor. But first... Ladies and gentlemen, it's my understanding you've reached a verdict. Is that correct? Yes. A verdict is handed down in the trial of Wisconsin versus Theodore Edgecombe. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. After just two hours of two and a half hours of deliberation, a Wisconsin jury reaches a verdict in the murder trial of Theodore Edgecombe. We the jury find the defendant, Theodore Edgecombe, guilty of first degree reckless homicide, a lesser included offense of count one of the information. Based on that, the jury was requested and asked to answer a second question. Did the defendant commit the offense of first degree reckless homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Answer, yes. It's signed today by the four person who's juror number four. Based on that verdict, everybody, I'm gonna pull the jury. All right, I've pulled the jury. The jury has confirmed their verdict of guilty of first degree reckless homicide a lesser included offense of count one of the information. Edgecombe now faces up to 60 years in prison. He was found guilty of first degree reckless homicide, the lesser offense to first degree intentional homicide charges. That conviction carries a mandatory life sentence of in prison in Wisconsin. Edgecombe's conviction stems from the September 2020 death of Jason Clearman, a Milwaukee immigration attorney. Edgecombe says he was riding his bike when Clearman and his wife swiped him with their car. Video footage shows Edgecombe punching Clearman through the open passenger side window. After that, the car follows Edgecombe. Security footage shows Clearman eventually get out of the car and confront the defendant. That's when Edgecombe shot him. He was arrested six months later in Kentucky. While Edgecombe always maintained self-defense, he testified, quote, the gun just went off. He also pled guilty to felony and misdemeanor bail jumping in connection to the case. Sentencing for Edgecombe is set for April 8th. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Matthew Mangino and Terry Austin. Matthew, what's your reaction to the speed in which the jury dropped the first two counts and went straight to reckless homicide? Well, yeah, it was quick. It was two and a half hours. And uh, really, uh, Brian, I, I think this was a compromised verdict. I think they looked at both of these individuals as not, not having clean hands. Um, they, 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 uh, uh, the victim followed him. Um, he, he confronted him. Uh, the defendant turned around, shot him in the face. You know, I, I think that they believe that there was some provocation, but there wasn't self-defense, primarily because the defendant himself did not say it was self-defense. He said it was an accidental shooting. Uh, so I, I believe it was a compromise based on the fact that both of the defendant and the victim here uh, did not have clean hands in the way this whole uh, thing turned out. Yeah, no clean hands. That's definitely a good way to put it. Terry, the jury settled for a first degree reckless homicide. Do you think defense counsel should have explained the differences between the charges to the jury a little better? Absolutely. He should have done two things, explain the charges and also explain that self-defense. So he should have said that the defendant intended to defend himself, but he didn't intend to kill the victim. So that would explain the discrepancy in that testimony. And he should have explained what homicide by negligent handling of a dangerous weapon is, because that is the least charge that he was charged with. And that's 10 years versus the 60 years he's going to get for that first degree reckless homicide. So if he explained that, maybe he'd get some less time there. Yeah, seems like the jury was receptive to some arguments, but not to all. We'll see how that plays out as sentencing comes up soon. On to news out of Idaho for the latest development on the so-called doomsday duo. On Thursday, Judge Stephen Boyce ruled the defense can have more time to file a motion to dismiss the case. Chad Daybell and his wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, face a 2023 trial for the murders of her children, Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, along with the murder of Tammy Daybell, Chad's first wife. 
Months after the children were reported missing, their bodies were found on Chad Daybell's property. The pair became known as the Doomsday Duo because of their belief that the end of time was near. On Thursday, Chad Daybell did not appear virtually in the hearing, but was represented by attorney John Pryor. Pryor argued a lengthy grand jury transcript set him back on drafting future motions, while the prosecution argued multiple extensions have already been granted. This is five days of grand jury testimony. Uh, the standard judge is excusable neglect, but there hasn't been any neglect here. What there has been, I've been diligent in going through all of this information, reviewing all of this, and quite frankly, judge, uh, the, the magnitude of the work um, uh, is going to require that I'll need some additional time to do that. The state in this case did not object to Mr. Pryor's first two motions. Uh, as, as has already been stated, the grand jury transcript was not prepared. That's certainly good cause for an extension of time. Uh, however, uh, the court would further, uh, the state would further note uh, that uh, there are, those timelines do exist and failure to exercise those rights in a timely manner does uh, constitute a waiver of such right. And as you've indicated, you do now have uh, com the, the completed transcripts and you've reviewed those. So I don't know that this needs to get extended any longer than possible because I think the state is correct that it's entitled to know the answer to this question as it's preparing for trial, which it's already starting to do. So I will grant the motion. A hearing for a motion to dismiss the case is set for March 18th. In Florida, a convicted killer will spend the rest of her life behind bars for the murder of her former co-worker. In December, a jury found Kimberly Kessler guilty of first-degree murder in the death of Jolene Cummings, a 34-year-old mother of three who disappeared in 2018. The two worked together at a hair salon, and Cummings' body has never been found. Jurors also convicted her on theft charges for dumping Cummings' vehicle the night of her disappearance. Kessler had a reputation for loud outbursts when she was wheeled into the courtroom for trial, yelling things about her former attorney being related to the victim, which wasn't the case. So, Kessler watched the court proceedings from a separate room. There was also a debate over her ability to stand trial. She was originally deemed incompetent after her arrest in 2019. She was sentenced Thursday to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, after 27 years on the Supreme Court, Justice Stephen Breyer is set to retire, who President Joe Biden says may be appointed next. But first, Prince Andrew says he wants a trial by jury in the Virginia Jufre's sexual assault lawsuit. All that and more still ahead. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our law and crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. An update now out of Texas. An armed and dangerous fugitive is now in custody after investigators say he shot and killed an officer last weekend. Oscar Rosales is charged with capital murder in the death of Corporal Charles Galloway. Investigators say Rosales shot Galloway during a traffic stop Sunday morning. Houston's police chief says video shows Rosales get out of his car with an assault-type weapon and open fire on Galloway while the deputy was still sitting in his patrol vehicle. Rosales was on the run for days until he was found at a hotel in Mexico, nearly 600 miles west of Houston. Rosales' wife and brother-in-law are charged with tampering with evidence after they were found cleaning the truck. Investigators say he was driving at the time of the shooting. Rosales' arrest comes amid a string of officer-involved shootings over the last week, including two New York City police officers who were killed in the line of duty while answering a domestic violence call. Also, a Wisconsin sheriff's deputy was shot and killed on Wednesday morning. The suspect was later found dead by suicide. And Prince Andrew is formally denying any claims that convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein trafficked girls to him. He's now demanding a jury trial in the Virginia Jufre sexual abuse lawsuit. Jufre has alleged for years that Epstein and his former companion, Ghislaine Maxwell, 
force her to have sex with their friends, including Prince Andrew, two decades ago when she was underage. In the filing submitted on Wednesday, the prince did admit to spending time with Epstein and Maxwell on several occasions over the last 22 years. All this comes just two weeks after a judge denied Prince Andrew's request to dismiss Dufresne's lawsuit and after Queen Elizabeth stripped Prince Andrew of his royal titles earlier this month. Maxwell was convicted in December of several sex crimes, including sex trafficking. She is set to be sentenced in June. Her co-conspirator and former boyfriend Epstein was charged with similar crimes, but he was found dead in his jail cell before he went to trial. Let's bring back criminal defense attorney Matthew Mangino and Terry Austin to discuss Prince Andrew's response to trafficking allegations. Terry, Prince Andrew continues to deny Dufresne's claims, but now he says that if any sexual activity did occur, it was consensual. Can he have it both ways? I don't think that works. He has a legal right to claim in the alternative. But on the one hand, you are claiming you didn't have sex. But if you did, it was consensual. It doesn't look good to the jury. It was either one or the other. These types of alternate arguments work best if the underlying facts are similar. So, for instance, a malicious assault versus whether or not it was a reckless assault. The underlying facts are the same, but actually you can argue the alternative. So I think it doesn't work here. Yeah, especially in front of a jury. Matthew, along with asserting 11 affirmative defenses, Prince Andrew is demanding a jury trial. Why do you think he wants that over a bench trial? Well, you know, as we know, um, Brian, this is an answer to a complaint. Uh, the complaint was filed. The lawsuit was filed. Uh, Prince Andrew tried to have that dismissed without filing a response. That was uh, denied. So now he has to file a formal response. So, so a lot of these are boilerplate answers. You know, I don't have enough information to form a, uh, uh, an opinion or a decision as to the uh, truth or falsity of the averment, those sorts of things. And it's customary at this point, certainly, to ask for a jury trial. I think ultimately they're going to want a jury trial. They're not going to want to go in front of a judge with this kind of uh, evidence and these kind of statements. They're going to want to go in front of a, you know, a, a jury of his peers, if you can find peers for a prince, uh, but a jury of his peers, and hope that, that they can convince them that the prosecution can't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. All right, we'll see how it plays out as we're just in the beginning phase of this. Coming up on Law and Crime Daily, the government's star witness takes a stand in the federal trial of Michael Avenatti. Plus, President Joe Biden is doubling down on a campaign promise. Who could be appointed next to the Supreme Court of the United States? Welcome back. President Joe Biden promises to nominate the first black woman to the Supreme Court just one day after Justice Stephen Breyer announced his plans to retire. In a press conference on Thursday, President Biden reinforced a longtime campaign promise that his first Supreme Court nomination would be a black woman. He said it was, quote, long overdue that a black woman be appointed to the highest court. He also commended Justice Breyer on his 28 years of service as a SCOTUS justice. The 83-year-old Justice Breyer is the oldest Supreme Court justice, and notably, he is one of three remaining liberal justices. President Biden said the future appointee would embody important characteristics like integrity. I was proud and grateful to be there at the start of this distinguished career in the Supreme Court. And I'm very proud to be here today on his announcement of his retirement. Choosing someone to sit in the Supreme Court I believe it is one of the most serious constitutional responsibility a president has. Our process is going to be rigorous. I will select a nominee worthy of Justice Breyer's legacy of excellence and decency. While I've been studying candidates' backgrounds and writings, I've made no decision except one. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience, and integrity. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. It's long overdue, in my view. I made that commitment during the campaign for president, and I will keep that commitment. President Biden says he intends to announce his decision by the end of February, but he has not yet made a decision. Right now, the court is split six to three between conservative and liberal justices. 
criminal defense attorney Matthew Mangino and co-host Terry Austin join us to discuss the SCOTUS future. Terry, Biden has promised to select a black woman as the next Supreme Court justice. Why do you think this is so important to him? You know, it's important to him because he understands that black women are underrepresented in leadership positions. And he said he wants to change those dynamics, and it's very important for him to do so. He made a presidential promise, and he's going to keep that. And it's interesting, James Clyburn actually reminded him to mention that during the campaign. So he wants to keep that promise. Now, Matthew, Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson is believed to be on the short list of appointees. And if selected, she would be the first former public defender. How could that affect SCOTUS? Well, I think it would be important to have a, a former public defender be a part of the court uh, to get that perspective of criminal defense, particularly indigent criminal defense. Uh, when we think of, um, you know, Judge Jackson, uh, she's on the D.C. Circuit, which which is kind of a prerequisite to being on the Supreme Court. She would be the fourth member of the court who's from the D.C. Circuit. Uh, she was a Breyer uh, um, clerk. So uh, she fits the profile, and I think she would be uh, an excellent uh, member of the United States Supreme Court. All right, we'll see how that process goes. Um, so much grooming for this, and of course, we will follow it as it continues down the process of a new Supreme Court justice. When we come back, the federal trial of disgrace attorney Michael Avenatti. Stormy Daniels takes the stand as a prosecution star witness. That's still ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. We head to Minnesota for day four in the federal trial of three former Minneapolis police officers charged in the death of George Floyd. On the stand Thursday, a longtime academy instructor. Now Inspector Katie Blackwell told jurors about the duty officers have to intervene if someone is using unnecessary force on a suspect. Blackwell is the first Minnesota officer to testify in the case. She testified about the department's official policy mandating officers prioritize sanctity of life in any situation. Prosecutors say three former officers, J. Alexander King, Thomas Lane, and Tu Tao, deprived Floyd of his constitutional rights by not intervening when Derek Chauvin held him down, murdering him. As of now, Lane is expected to testify in the case. He is the only defendant not charged with failure to intervene, presumably because he asked Chauvin multiple times to change Floyd's position. Cameras are not allowed inside the federal courtroom throughout the trial. The three officers will also have a state trial that is scheduled for June. Also in federal court, the prosecution's star witness takes the stand in the trial of disgrace attorney Michael Avenatti. Avenatti's former client and the star witness in the case, Stormy Daniels, testified on Thursday. Daniels, whose real name is Stephanie Clifford, alleges Avenatti stole $300,000 out of an advance for her memoir. Prosecutors say Avenatti forged her signature and later lied to her about where the money was going. An indictment says he used the money to pay law firm employees and for personal expenses, like making a luxury car payment. Avenatti rose to fame while representing Daniels, a one-time adult film actress who accused former President Donald Trump of providing her with hush money payments to quiet news of their affair. On Thursday, Avenatti began cross-examination of Daniels. It's expected to continue on Friday. Law & Crime Network's Adam Claffield was at the courthouse Thursday. He tells us the judge already appears to be frustrated with Avenatti. Well, it was a dramatic day on the stand. Right before the proceedings even began today, you had Michael Avenatti informing the judge that he intended to cross-examine Stormy Daniels for six hours. And the judge's response uh, was, we'll see about those six hours. So right off the bat, we... we set the stage for this combative cross-examination, but today was about direct examination. We saw the beginning of his cross-examination today with Stormy Daniels. Uh, we, uh, we, there weren't too many surprises there. We knew going in that he was going to try to discredit her because of her uh, appearance in this TV series, Spooky Babes, uh, and her belief in the paranormal. Uh, this was something that was signaled when he was represented by lawyers, um, but he's questioning her about her beliefs in the paranormal, uh, asked her whether she has said that she has spoken to and seen dead people. She said yes. 
Uh, so no surprises there. Matthew Abenati's argument seems to suggest this is a contract dispute blown out of proportion. Does he have some kind of an advantage representing himself because he knows the contract and what was said? Well, I don't know that it's ever an advantage to represent yourself. I mean, we've heard over and over uh, about the comments of Abraham Lincoln and, and others. Uh, but, you know, you, you don't switch horses midstream. Uh, this is going to be a, a very difficult process. Already, as we've heard, uh, there's some um, animosity between him and the judge and how he's going to direct his cross-examination. Uh, you know, to suggest that this is a, con a contractual dispute, certainly there was a contract, uh, but um, he forged a letter, allegedly, uh, to divert money that was supposed to go to Stormy Daniels into his own account. Uh, that, that gets beyond contract disputes. Now we're talking about criminal activity, and that's why we're here uh, in, in this case right now. Uh, so I, I don't think he's going to impress the jury uh, with his lawyering on his own behalf. And uh, I think he had a long road to hoe here. Yeah. Now, Terry, Stormy Daniels testified in court and claimed that Abenati would represent her for $100 plus a share of any money awarded as a result of the lawsuit against Trump. Does that sound right? It doesn't sound right, Brian. Who would represent anyone for $100? But apparently, Abenati said that he would raise money in a defense fund. But even that doesn't sound right to me because he could be ethically influenced there if he wanted to raise more money. So I don't think it makes sense. You know, we'll see how it plays out. Well, thank you for joining us here at Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.